Hello and welcome. Well, when you discover the exhilarating news that you're going to be a mum for the first time or again, naturally the focus is on the health and well-being of your unborn baby and with good reason. That said, it is critically important that you equally look after your body. After all, it's busily and miraculously creating another human being. And whilst there are numerous topics and discussion points on how, what and when you can do this, Today, we are addressing the fascinating topic of your pelvic floor. <laughs> to do this, we welcome our special guest, Sue Croft, a physiotherapist with over 43 years experience. And for the last 30, 30 years, she's been working in pelvic health physiotherapy. Thanks for joining us, Sue. How are you doing? Hi, I'm very well, Rachel. Thank you very much for inviting me to come along and talk. Oh, this is wonderful. Look, I've never heard of pelvic health physiotherapy before, and I can't wait to hear all about it. <laughs> but yeah. to, to begin with, um, you know, it is an extremely thrilling and exciting time planning for the ar arrival of your new uh, newborn baby with the focus on setting up the nursery, um, you know, deciding on prams, breast pumps, um, baby clothes, picking up your baby's name, all that exciting stuff. So really, I guess it's, you know, no surprise that women are not equally inspired and interested in strengthening their pelvic floor muscles at the same time. <laughs> but, and this is something yes. that is commonly overlooked. So I'd love to know initially, like, why is this so important to do in these early stages of pregnancy? So the pelvic floor is really crucial to our happiness through our life. So if you think about it, we socially train children to be dry and managing their bowel motions from two or three years of age. So it's, it's a really important part of our acceptance in society. So if women have babies and start to have problems with bladder bowel function, with sexual dysfunction, um, then this has a really big impact and, and pelvic floor dysfunction can be very socially isolating. It yeah. causes depression. It causes women to maybe stop working and then the way they normally would have worked before. And it actually stops them exercising. So it has profound effects on their happiness, their well-being. And I think um, what my goal has been my whole career in women's health has been education. Uh, it's, it's the actual one of the key pillars of what we do is educating about what is normal and what goes wrong. So I think bringing that message into the pregnancy is often, and even into the pre-pregnancy, I mean, there are actually pre-pregnancy um, uh, sort of sessions now that girls can go to and they can learn about how to conceive, you know, what's the best time to conceive. So I think that's even a better time to start mentioning the pelvic floor because this is when they're likely to go and seek help and get assessment and understand a little bit about the maybe risk factors that some of them may have. It's a little bit more, I've never heard about this, um, I guess, preconceiving work on the, on the pelvic floor. Where, where can um, women access um, those, those support services? So understanding how to do a pelvic floor contraction, it, about up to 30% of women may actually do the wrong thing when they try and do a pelvic floor contraction. So when we tighten our pelvic floor muscles, we should feel lift and squeeze. So these muscles, I'm going to bring a little prop in here so you can have a little look. This is for so anyone watching the live pelvis. video. Yep. <laughs> yeah. There's the pelvis. Oh, I see radio, so it may not be. Yeah. There's the pelvic floor muscles. So they sit like a, a basin or a hammock around the base of the pelvis. And so they're very integral to bladder and bowel function and sexual function. And so if we can actually see a woman pre-birth and actually um, – a pre-pregnancy, sorry, and actually teach them how to do a correct action. And if they're having any problems getting lift and squeeze, then we can actually try and do some retraining. Now, sometimes girls actually have so little movement in their pelvic floor because these muscles are often what we call overactive. So they might be doing a lot of abdominal um, work. They might be doing a lot of stiffness of the pelvic floor muscles by the way they sit. And so they don't really understand how to lift and relax those muscles. So if I can see them or any pelvic health physiotherapist could see them pre-pregnancy, then we're able to examine them and teach them what the correct action is and what the incorrect moves are. So that would be an advantage. If someone's thinking about getting pregnant, 
have that assessment, learn how to do a correct action, learn what the correct positions are. We're going to talk a little bit later. It's not all about the pelvic floor muscles, what the correct positions are for emptying your bladder and bowel, what are good bladder habits, what are good bowel habits. So we can teach all that in a pre-pregnancy assessment. Because once you are pregnant, I mean, there are definitely some precautions in terms of having an internal examination for some women. And mm -hmm. so we wouldn't do that before at least 14 weeks. Sometimes we might wait till 20 weeks where they have that ultrasound at 20 weeks. Um, sometimes we might wait till right towards the end. So we're sort of missing that lovely window of opportunity. So if someone's thinking I'm going to start my family next year, then the year before is the time to come and get that assessment and find out, well, how do I do a proper pelvic floor contraction? Am I lifting properly? Am I relaxing properly? Do I have any pelvic pain? The Wonderful. other thing that we can, the other thing we can do at that appointment is if we've got someone, there are certain risk factors when you thinking about having a vaginal birth. And so one easy to think about one is that if you're less than 160 centimetres in height, then you've got an increased risk of having pelvic floor dysfunction with the vaginal birth. So getting that piece of information, thinking, oh, okay, right, um, I am that I am 157 centimetres, I might go and, and have myself assessed and look at those key factors. And that's something they can then raise with their obstetrician and say, well, look, the research tells us that these women are more at risk of having pelvic health um, injuries and so pelvic floor dysfunction. So um, you, they can discuss mode of delivery in an informed way. I think the big message is we want information out there. and We want our ladies to be informed in all the things that can happen with a vaginal birth and a cesarean birth and, and a pregnancy. Wonderful advice. Thank you for sharing all that with us, Sue. That's, that's great. You've, um, you've also written two patient-directed books which both demystify pelvic floor dysfunction and give uh, simple, easy-to-follow strategies for patients. Um, to begin with, it would be great to ascertain, you know, what is um, pelvic floor dysfunction and really what causes it just initially? Yeah. So pelvic floor dysfunction really is a very broad term and it encompasses a lot of different things. So as I've alluded to, like we see children and children can have problems with urinary leakage, with faecal incontinence, with, with holding behaviours, with bowel motion. So um, they can have all sorts of issues. And so actually um, bedwetting, of course, is when it's late bedwetting. So not, not at a sort of five... A year old but you know if it's getting much old if the child is getting much older than five and a half to six you know they're starting to go to school and there might be sleepovers and it certainly becomes a problem for them so having some intervention from a pelvic health physiotherapist who specializes in pediatrics who does treat children is is a very useful thing the thing is that when children have problems with constipation or um, urinary symptoms that often carries through into their adolescence and into their um, when they're grown up. So pelvic floor dysfunction encompasses anything for men, women, or children. It can be pelvic pain. Mm -hmm. So girls who in during their adolescence have got extreme period pain. Now there's a big work, a lot of work happening to try and get the message out there that period pain in the extreme is not normal. And it possibly is an indicator that something else is going on and that getting some intervention earlier rather than waiting till perhaps this girl might have some endometriosis related pain. And the, in Australia, it takes seven to 10 years to get that uh, endometriosis diagnosed. So actually getting early, earlier intervention by saying, you know what, that degree of period pain is not normal and mm -hmm. you need to go and see a specialist in that area. And that would be a gynecologist who specialises in endometriosis. And mm -hmm. then they might send them to a pelvic health physiotherapist who's, who does work with pelvic pain to try and teach them strategies as to how to stop that pain from being so bad. Okay. Um, it can mean men and women can uh, leak urine, but of course, what causes pelvic floor dysfunction for women commonly is pregnancy and the postpartum period after a vaginal and less frequently a cesarean birth. So what are some of the more, most common pelvic floor issues that women ex experience then? So urinary leakage, um, well, either with cough or sneeze or when they're playing sport. 
um, and when they get a short, sharp burst of leakage, and it might be, um, there's an interesting sort of term around called light bladder leakage, LBL. And it's not actually an um, International Continent Society uh, definition. It's, it's been picked up as sort of something where maybe perhaps a pad company has actually um, labelled that and called it LBL. And so incontinence is any urine that sneaks out when it really shouldn't. And so some people say, oh, I don't leak uh, urine. I haven't got incontinence. I just leak a little bit LBL. So, you know, any urinary leakage is leakage, is incontinence. So urinary incontinence. The other type of urinary incontinence is what we call urge incontinence. And urge incontinence is when you get the urge and you're trying to make the toilet, but the bladder starts to contract before you actually make the toilet. So that you're starting to leak as you're trying to open the door, pull down your stockings and get onto the loo. So urge incontinence is commonly associated with older women and past the menopause, but many young girls can have it as well and children can have it as well. So an urgent bladder is very distressing in that it sort of causes women to start bad habits like going just in case before they leave the house, when they get to the doctor's surgery, when they get to the movies. And so part of the education we do is teaching them all those good bladder habits like don't go just in case, like letting your bladder fill to that 350 to 500 mils, which is what the normal capacity of the bladder is. Mm -hmm. So they can also, particularly post vaginal birth, suffer a condition called prolapse. And prolapse is when the internal organs, so perhaps the bladder, the uterus or the bowel, actually starts to descend and move down the vagina and towards the entrance. So this is very distressing for women and it means that, um, you know, part of the education I've got to do is to say really having a vaginal birth, there is always likely to be some degree of laxity and we've got to calm women down and say, you know, you, you've got to stay calm, we'll measure things, we'll look at things and we'll give you strategies to manage that very well. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, the statistics are that 50% of women over the age of 50 will have some degree of vaginal prolapse but only 15 percent of those women are symptomatic okay so 50 percent might have some vaginal prolapse but only 15 are actually symptomatic mm -hmm. so what does pelvic floor dysfunction actually feel like then so what pelvic floor dysfunction feels like is with prolapse, you will feel a bulge, okay? So the woman might feel like a tampon is dislodged. She might feel a heaviness or a drag. She might find that her urinary stream becomes quite weak and it's a bit less strong than it was because the prolapse itself causes a little bit of obstruction. Okay. She might find that she's having difficulty with evacuation. So passing a bowel motion might become more difficult because the bowel motion gets caught in the prolapse in the back wall. And so she might suffer what's called incomplete evacuation. So she gets some out, but always leaves some behind. And she's aware of that and she's very distressed by it. Mm -hmm. So heaviness, drag, bulge, rather than it being pain. So pain itself is not a usual symptom of prolapse. Um, but more drag and heaviness. Interesting. Okay. Now, we published your article titled Pelvic Floor Exercises Before and After Birth, Putting Your Life Jacket On First. Now, for someone who hasn't yet read the article, can you please just give us an overview what it's about and just tell us, Sue, what inspired you to write it? What key messages you want to get across? Look, I the key message I want to get across right from the beginning is that if you think about a footballer or a netballer, they're playing sport, they're injured during their game and immediately people rush around and they're paying attention to them. Um, there's intense physiotherapy on their muscle injury or their joint injury. And there's sometimes some, you know, for some they need to have surgery, but there's a lot of attention, a lot of money is spent on them. And yet women have their babies and either with a cesarean birth or a vaginal birth, and 
you know, that whilst they've had quite a lot of visits during the pregnancy, the antenatal period to see their obstetrician, there hasn't been any emphasis to, emphasis to say at six weeks, come and see me. They get the tick, you can go home, take, go on, take the baby home, back home, and that's it. And what the message I want to get across and why I wrote the article was really to say there's a lot that we need to do and pay attention to women and offer them services. And I think maybe, you know, there's been a petition started to try and help women get some funding for postnatal visits. So over in European countries, they offer regular postnatal period, uh, postnatal um, visits to a public health physiotherapist or to have some treatment. They're often given things like an e-stimulation machine if the muscles are weak, or they're given a biofeedback machine if the muscles are weak to try and help them do some training. And so my uh, goal would be that it would be routine. Women would be assisted in funding to attend those appointments so they can have a good recovery. If you have a really trouble-free vaginal delivery, you'll be feeling really on top of the world. Your pelvic floor muscles may not change much. You might have known how to do them before. They might feel just a little bit different, slightly different. There might be a bit of swelling early on, but they pretty much spring back. And things that influence that are your age. So the older you are when you have your first baby, the more at risk that you aren't going to get those muscles springing back and that you are going to have more risk of having a vaginal delivery that causes some injury to the muscles. So having insight into knowing that you need to come and treat that like a footballer's injury or a netballer's knee, you know, you've got to realise you've pushed a baby through a space which some biomedical engineers working in an, an anatomy lab over in America with Professor John Delancey, who's a very famous urogynecologist and anatomist, they came to, they worked together to try and work out the biomechanic, uh, biomechanical parts of looking at pelvic floor dysfunction. And they came back to him and they said, John, this childbirth thing, it just doesn't work. It's, you know, they put a bowling ball through the same dimensions and they couldn't make it work. And yet women every day are doing this. And so <laughs> I think we've got to appreciate that there's, Absolutely. there's going to be some micro tearing of muscles. There's going to be potentially some injury to bony parts even. Uh, and there's other areas in the vagina that are going to be affected. So we've got to give these girls attention and we've got to help them with their recovery. Yes. Now, in your article, you share six steps to create a great pelvic floor regime. Could you maybe just briefly just share some of them with us now? Yeah. So first of all, just knowing what a pelvic floor exercise is. Mm -hmm. and, and before we move off that, I want to say when I get referrals to our practice here, because it, regardless of what the condition is, the, the treatment is always give pelvic floor exercises. So when you go to see your pelvic health physiotherapist, you might actually sometimes be told, well, we don't really want you doing a lot of those because you've got a pelvic pain condition. And we might be actually teaching you how to relax those muscles. So it's not all about when you just don't pick up a leaflet and you don't just start doing pelvic floor. Because if you've got a problem, it might actually be an issue. And I want you to really say you've got to see that specialist pelvic health physio yes. so that they can direct you. Don't just start doing pelvic floor exercises, even from my book, you know, because if you can't work out, if you've got a pain condition, even though it does talk about pain in there, where we've, we really, the emphasis is completely different. So you've got to really be careful about it, um, when to do them or not. So know what are pelvic floor exercises, that when you do a contraction, you feel lift and squeeze, and that you must concentrate on feeling nice relaxation. Um, getting an understanding of how, where they are and how to activate them. And so because this is tied up with an area which is very personal for women, um, they might, some of our listeners might actually find it quite confronting to think that they have to come to a complete stranger and have an internal vaginal examination because that's how we find them. They're internal muscles in the vagina and that's how we have to locate them and teach you how to use them. And so your pelvic health physiotherapist is going to really take you through it uh, in, a, in explaining what is involved, asking your consent explaining that you may give your consent, but it 
can be withdrawn at any time if you're feeling bothered or triggered by what's happening. Because if a woman's had a traumatic vaginal delivery, the process of actually just getting up on the table and having an examination is very confronting for them. It may bring them flashbacks that might trigger them into re-experiencing what happened at the birth. So I think it's very important to say that, you know, we are very careful and mindful about that when we're examining women. So we understand that we, and we get that they might be not coping very well. And mm -hmm. it might be that they can't continue even with the examination on that day. Interesting. Um, yes. So that's the first two. The next one is know how to correctly activate them with professional advice. So I think I've alluded to that, that you can't just read a leaflet and or read my book. I mean, I give lots of cues and so do and clues and so do leaflets, but understanding and having that one-on-one -on -one with someone is, is very important. Um, we talk also about in the article that we're going to... Uh, you know, what should you know about it? So we want them to be done as a way to help reduce swelling postnatally, um, that we actually might have some sensory changes due to maybe some nerve damage. And I do talk about what are the da things that can happen. So one of the injuries that can happen with a vaginal delivery is something which we call levator, meaning the levator muscles. That's what the pelvic floor muscles are called, the levator ani muscles. Um, the levator avulsion injury. So this is where the muscles can partially uh, or fibres or, you know, quite significantly pull away from the bone where they're attached. So this wow. is a really significant injury. And yet, you know, here's your baby, off you go. You know, there's no... It, women are not examined to see if that has happened afterwards because, you know, it's very early days. They might quite early feel there's a difference, especially if they've learnt where their pelvic floor muscles are before they have the baby. They might say, wow, something feels very different doesn't, in there. Doesn't feel right. Yes. Doesn't feel right. And so when they come to see us, maybe at six to eight weeks, they might already be aware that, yes, I know something's different. So something feels different and I can't lift that side, it feels different on the right side compared to the left side. Mm -hmm. um, so, and we also have some do's and don'ts of how to do public floor exercising. Yeah, so I was going to ask you about that. The, yeah, so one <laughs> of the things is that these public floor muscles do what we call co-activate or co-contract with a lot of muscles around the pelvis. So if you squeeze your inner thighs together, then your pelvic floor will activate. But we don't do that as a way of exercising. So when we're first learning how to do it, we actually do exercises with our pelvic floor, trying to think about keeping it away from not lots of abdominal work, not lots of inner thighs, not lots of buttocks squeezing, that we're actually trying to really focus our attention on those pelvic floor muscles. And we don't want to actually flare your ribs. So you, when you have a big breath in, you know, your ribs flare and there's a whole body movement going on here. We want to keep it down and think about vagina anus. So think vagina anus. Don't think, oh, I'm going to try really hard. I'm going to have this big breath in and everything sort of seizes up and you're tensioning your whole body. We want it very, everything else to be relaxed. And most importantly, we want you to breathe. So breathing and maintaining your breathing. When you go to gyms and exercise with lifting weights, there may be an emphasis on ex exhale on effort. So as you lift the weight, make sure you're exhaling so you're not sort of holding your breath and put that pushes down on the pelvic floor. Mm -hmm. But one of the things, if you're struggling to get that coordination and you think, oh, I just held my breath when I really should have exhaled on effort as I lifted up that weight. One thing is just to say, keep breathing. So just keep breathing or talking out loud. If you're talking, you can't be holding your breath. And so, you know, when, if you're getting confused about your breathing, just say that to yourself. All right, I'm going to keep breathing while I do this contraction. The other thing that's very important is, as I've said before, we must relax and let these muscles go. If you, Rachel, were sitting there now and I asked you to do a really strong contraction of your biceps muscles. So I said, really, really grip mm -hmm. your biceps very hard. And I said, yep, that's it. Show me those muscles. Now keep doing it, Rachel. Keep doing it. 
keep doing it. And I said, now do it for two days. Well, what yeah. would happen? Your muscles would be sore and aching. Fatigued. They yeah. would be fatigued. And when you tried to lift the box, you would find they were weak. And so if we've learned now that your pelvic floor muscles co-activate with your tummy, your, your inner thigh muscles, your butt muscles, then if you're, if you're crossing your thighs because you want to sit tall with you know, good posture and don't open your legs up, you've got to cross your legs, everything in your pelvic floor is on, on, on all the time. And so if you also post-delivery are having some gas control issues, some fecal incontinence, some urinary incontinence. Well, these girls walk around terrified with everything clenched all the time. Mm -hmm. And so they end up coming back in a year's time and they've got pelvic pain. And so what we've got to really emphasize when you're doing a pelvic floor, yes, we want to feel lift and squeeze, but we also need to feel that relaxation, relaxation. that when you've let go, you make sure you keep it off for a while and let it recover. Muscles need time to recover and mm. that's what's important okay and and why do you think good attention to pelvic health before and after a baby really matters because it is so full of impact on a woman's life she can barely focus on her child and giving it lots of love and smiles and attention and all the things that make babies they love their mums they're getting eye contact if a girl is terrified because every time she stands up she leaks or every time she can't distinguish and discriminate between passing wind or passing stool or she's got pelvic pain or she's got prolapse and she's unable to be sexually active with a partner because of pelvic pain or because she feels like she's not womanly anymore because she's got a prolapse you know this is going to affect her mood you know depression uh, anxiety and and as I said some of the girls can actually have post-traumatic stress disorder because of the um, actual vaginal birth and what's actually happened through it and mm -hmm. and that doesn't have to be that there's even pelvic floor dysfunction it can be that it was it just ended differently to what she thought was going to happen you know mm -hmm. she did have to have an emergency caesar and she was all primed for having a beautiful vaginal delivery but in the end she had to have that Caesar because the baby may have been, you know, compromised and they needed to get in there and get it out. So they might not actually have any injury per se, but they're going to be traumatized from that particular birth experience. And so, so there is, oh, sorry, go on. You no, know, I was just going to ask you, so what does happen if the birth doesn't go as planned then? That's... So I think that seeing someone experienced in, in how to not, to calm the girls down. And I think that, you know, pelvic health physiotherapists are used to seeing all sorts of these conditions. So incontinence, prolapse, all these things. And so they can also say, look, we've got, this may have happened, but we've got this muscle and that's working and this is not too bad. And this is early days. And there's going to be some natural recovery in the first 12 months try not to panic, stay calm. Let's try and focus on what we can do today and what can we do in the future. Today, we're going to learn how to do a pelvic floor contraction and also that when you go to lift the baby or cough or sneeze, we want you to engage those muscles first up. So we want you to do what's called bracing or the knack where you tighten your muscles and then you cough. You tighten the muscles and then you lift the baby. So mm -hmm. that you're activate what that's used to what ha that's what used to happen automatically before we had children, but after that that automatic response is not there, so we have to learn how to switch it on from our brain. Mm -hmm. So that's what we do in that first appointment: teach them good bladder habits, teach them good bowel positions, teach them how not to strain, how to do the knack, how to do some pelvic floor muscle training to bulk up the muscles to the best of their advantage. Then we might say to some of those girls who've got prolapse, look, you know what, there's some things that we can do to help you with that with a prop. So a pessary is an intravaginal device, which is made of silicon, and we pop it into the vagina and that helps to give some support. So what people often say, throwaway line, look, incontinence won't kill you. 
But if a girl is in her 30s and she starts to leak and she was a runner before she had the baby and now she can't run without wetting herself, then she stops exercising and that is going to perhaps affect her outcome and her longevity and her health conditions, let alone what happens to her mental health. <laughs> so it is really important to understand that these pelvic floor dysfunctions uh, can be quite debilitating. And if we can talk openly about it, and that's why it's so great if we can have these conversations, because then girls understand actually there's a lot that can be done. Mm -hmm. But if the, the delivery doesn't go as planned, I don't want them panicking. I want them to come and get help you know and all around australia there are pelvic health physiotherapists working in the area and if you go on to the australian physiotherapy association find a physio line online support you can put your suburb in and you can get your you know the name of a physiotherapist who works in pelvic health um so you can go and get some help with them so what are those other um online resources that are available for women then yeah, so if you've had a delivery, and as I said, a traumatic delivery doesn't have to be only a vaginal delivery. Um, that can be um, the Australasian Birth Trauma Association. So they have a really excellent Facebook group as well as an online um, platform with lots of education. And it's got information for health professionals as well as, uh, but it's mostly patient orientated. Um, they have set up lots of fabulous things like peer-to-peer -peer support. So they've got training for girls to help other girls who've suffered this. And a lot of women are finding fantastic help from it. With any Facebook group, I think with you can also get terrified if you read a lot of stories on there. And so I think if you're finding when you're reading a lot of online stories, whether it's a pessary or a prolapse or an incontinence group or the birth trauma association group, if you're getting triggered and finding yourself feeling very morose and depressed about all this stuff that comes under the pelvic floor dysfunction group, then I think you're better to wait and see a physiotherapist and have a good conversation about how to take all that stuff on board without getting anxious and depressed and worried and feeling like there's absolutely nothing that can happen mm -hmm. because if you read a lot of stories like that it can be a little bit mood shifting so um you know i always say to people bit take little bits and you know it, you know you get support though particularly from apta um so the other peak organization for continence awareness is the continence foundation of australia and i'm actually uh the co-chair of the scientific committee that we're having uh, we had to pivot very quickly and move our conference which we have in melbourne uh, uh sorry <laughs> it was in brisbane this year it's melbourne next year it was in brisbane i was co-chairing it up here in brisbane sunny brisbane <laughs> and um we've turned that into a webinar series so in fact there's lots and lots of really good information and there are consumers who do actually um, go to the continents foundation of australia website and the other good thing that they're very very kindly funded by the commonwealth government um, and we they have a helpline and i've got the number here which um I can read out to you and you might put it into any notes that you've got. Um, it's 1800 33 0066. And so there are people waiting on the other end of that line and they actually can talk people through, um, give them some help, give them some strategies. They are often continence nurses who are on the other end um, and they can direct them to people who are in their area or region. Um, and the other thing that's happening these days is that because of COVID-19, everybody is telehealthing. So the information I've told you is very nicely delivered in a telehealth sort of service. So you can choose a physio who's close by you. And if you're in Melbourne and you can't get out, you can start by doing a telehealth session with them. And then when things open up, you can then go and see them and actually have that very important internal examination. So, you know, I want, don't want women to feel despairing that they're locked up and they can't do anything about it. You know, get most of the women's health physiotherapists around Australia are now offering telehealth services. And as I said, it works very well. So how can a pelvic floor physio help? I mean, when is a good time to see them? 
Um, and is it ever too late, I guess, for it to, to, I guess, start a session and, and, and see them for help? Yeah. So, you know, Rachel, my oldest patient who presented for the first time was in her nineties. And so it's never too late because I know that with that lady, I helped her sit properly with her bowels. Her bowels were her major problem. But the spin-off from that is because her constipation was better and it was easier for her to evacuate than her bladder function, which didn't even bother her. Like she didn't even really want to talk about it. But I sort of said, we've got to talk about this as well. Um, that started to improve as well. So the message is it's never too late and <laughs> the earlier the better. So if you are planning a pregnancy, then I would recommend that you go and see someone before you get pregnant. Um, who, if you are pregnant. Who, who in particular? Thank you, pardon? Who, what, what sort of um, specialist would you consider or would, would you recommend that they see? So I think we're, it has to be a physiotherapist who actually has a special interest in pelvic health. Yes. So okay, cool. we, you know, we, there are generalist physiotherapists and it is really important that you go to someone who actually is able to offer you that internal examination at some stage and who's able to give you that special, specialized knowledge about bladder and bowel and not just about pelvic floor exercises like it you know when if you if I had this big delicious apple pie here and I was saying to you I'm going to cut that into 12 slices one of those slices would represent the part that pelvic floor strengthening and understanding how to work them plays you know there's so much more information that we give and so understanding that it's a very comprehensive amount of information you're going to receive and it covers a lot of areas um, is very important. We haven't really touched much on sexual dysfunction and, and this is a huge cause of distress in relationships. If after a delivery, whether it's traumatic or not, you know, the mother is becoming often very focused on the baby and, you know, is feeling very nurturing towards the baby and less uh, like uh, having intercourse. If you breastfeed, then you become quite what we call de-estrogenized so that the vagina can get thin and dry. And so it feels uncomfortable. So if they try and have sex, then it might be quite painful. And so understanding that something as simple as having some local estrogen cream um, while you're breastfeeding well, after that first six weeks might be very helpful in terms of making the vagina feel much more comfortable. Mm -hmm. But that's part of, the, of what pelvic health physiotherapists do as well, is they will educate, give advice, assess, and offer really positive strategies to help that woman perhaps dip her toe back into having intercourse again with a partner. And that's really important for their relationship. Mm -hmm. So how long does it generally take to cure pelvic floor dysfunction then? Okay, so a long time ago, back in 2006, 2007, there was some research that showed that 60 to 80% of women can actually cure stress incontinence with doing a pelvic floor muscle training uh, program and using the NAC to actually help hold things. So that was over a course of about 12 weeks. So usually what happens is we see people in that first time, that's a long consultation because there's lots of education and then there's the assessment. And then oftentimes, depending on um, what that individual, like we've got, we've really got patient-centered care. So we're, we're not doing a generalized thing. We're looking at that patient. What are her particular problems? Now, if she's really anxious about a prolapse and we're trying to reevaluate and say, look, you know what, this is not so bad. We might need to get her back in a bit quicker at one or two weeks just to make sure her headspace is good and she's understanding everything that we talked about. Did she take it all in when she was so distressed? Um, secondly, what happens is that it mostly would be at about a month. So we'd give them a home program. They go away and do that. And then after that, it might be three months. So over the course of four months, they might be actually improved significantly to the, they're managing it. For other people, it can be that they might need to come six monthly for review to make sure that they're doing everything properly. If they have a pessary fitted, they might come 12 monthly to get a new pessary. So, but usually um, a significant amount of improvement for bladder and bowel issues and uh, prolapse management can happen over f about 12 to 16 weeks. 
but that's really not going weekly. That's actually going, you know, three or four times over that period of time. Mm -hmm. Well, look, there, there's lots of other things to discuss, which we may leave for another chat one day about, you know, for example, how um, even simple things like breathing um, and day-to-day um, -day things like even um, caffeine and those types of things, I guess, can sort of affect our pelvic floor dysfunction. But for the moment, um, I think we, we've really sort of touched on some really key messages um, for everyone watching and listening today. So could you maybe just summarise what your key messages are just for our audience and the key takeaways? Voice in this chat okay so get help early if you know you're going to have a baby next year go and see your pelvic health physiotherapist and get that idea of how to do it if you are pregnant it doesn't matter go and see the physio she will only assess you internally when it's appropriate and safe and then postnatally usually we wait till six weeks when there's no loss um, happening anymore um, but if you're having problems again because the telehealth all the physiotherapists are able to help you if you're having a particular problem even at two weeks we can advise you as to how to deal with that the second thing is I think it warrants more more attention um, the pelvic floor needs to be treated with as much love and care as any footballers quads and any netballers uh, ACL so I think we've got to accept and appreciate what women do when they grow a baby and then deliver it whatever, by whatever means. And I think we've got to really start a bit of noise about let's get some funding for more regular routine postnatal treatment for an appropriate length of time after they've had the baby recognise what's happened. And I think the other thing is this is a lifetime thing. Our quality of life is severely affected by things like uh, if you're having urinary incontinence, fecal incontinence or pelvic pain. So making sure that it doesn't matter how old you are, come and get some help. It doesn't matter how embarrassing it is. You know, unfortunately, because of the privacy nature of the area and perhaps some of the issues that people may have had in their earlier life that might feel they just are overwhelmed with embarrassment and it's shame. So it's really important to understand physiotherapists are really in tune with all of this and are very kind and considerate and will listen to your story. Wonderful, Sue. Look, if anyone's got any other questions for you um, and or would like to sort of hire your services also, whereabouts can they find you? So I have a practice with four other physiotherapists working with me at Highgate Hill in Brisbane. But I think Kittypedia's um, uh, audience is Australia wide. And so I really want to encourage you, all the, all the listeners, to uh, seek help from those, uh, that organisation, the Australian Physiotherapy Association. Just look, find a physio and look at the area near them. Um, certainly, they're welcome to send questions to our practice. And um, I also write a blog on pelvic floor dysfunction. So there are actually over 320 blogs within that. And so there's lots and lots and lots of information in that. Um, and so they can have a look, just Google Sue Croft blog. But as I said, I've got lots of colleagues around Australia who are all fabulous and and I, we can't see everybody here and I definitely want people to go and see their local physiotherapist who specialises in pelvic health so that they can try and get some help. And as I said, the Continents Foundation Australia have that helpline and I'll just repeat the number, 1800 33 0066. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your time today, Sue. And I really would love to have another chat with you um, in the not too distant future, just about the every, every, everyday um, sort of problems, I guess, that women can encounter. Um, but for the, for the most part, you've really touched on some really critical um, issues and topics today, which um, I've definitely learned a lot myself also. So thank you for your time. And hopefully we can speak again soon. Take care. Pleasure. Thank you, Rachel. Bye-bye. Okay, bye.